there we go right so and then I turn us off on the video on the uh, Facebook because otherwise you hear past past us okay so starting to fill up already so we've got about 11 people so I'll do a proper introduction in a minute when we've got a few people so I'm not repeating cool yeah no that's fine okay Simon's in Kerry's in Roberta's in um some the, oh, hang on. Oops, yeah. yeah so then you'll hear us yeah yes on them can somebody in the comment section just let me know if you are seeing this video particularly blurry it looks quite blurry for me on my playback simon wants to live in a shoe this life will not do okay thanks simon <laughs> Ah, okay, I think it started to stream it better. It's not blurry now, so that's good. Okay, so uh, another Academy, mem Academy member is there. Oh, gallery view. Um, yeah, don't worry too much, Simon. I'm, um, I'm gonna stop sharing now anyway, so that you don't, you can see both of us. We are in gallery view. So I should see that come up. Like I say, there's a little bit of a lag. And that should happen now. There we go. Fantastic. OK, so we've got 14 people um, and I typically explain we get around probably about 30 learners during the actual live itself. And then um, it will be viewed uh, considerably a bit more um, after that, um, which is lovely. So I'll do some brief introductions for the people that are here. Um, so for those of you, if anyone's new, I am Dr. Chloe Farahar of Orcademy. And Orcademy is an educative platform delivering um, education about anything relating to being autistic by purely autistic or otherwise neurodivergent um, educators. And when I say educators, doesn't necessarily mean with specific qualifications. So any autistic person is welcome to educate um, on Orcademy if they've got a topic that's useful for our learners. And I am joined today by Dr. Mary Doherty. Now, am I saying that right? Yeah. Okay, because I kept asking Harry, I'm really poor sometimes with pronunciation. Um, so hello, Mary. Thank hello. you for joining us today. Um, Mary is going to discuss with us today healthcare and healthcare barriers. Is that correct? Yes. For autistic people, um, which is really interesting and important and I think I first met you was it at the park conference yes, yes I think so yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. park is um Damien Milton and a number of other autistic um academics and researchers it's a um an initiative I guess which is participatory autism research collective mm -hmm. um where yeah, a number of autistic and non-autistic academics, researchers, um, anybody really, if they're interested, can come and, and hear um, talks. I think typically all given by autistic people, though. Am I? Mostly, not exclusively, but mostly, yeah. Largely so, yeah. Which, so I'm trying to think, which, which talk did we actually meet at? I don't know. I know I did the, it was the subtyping workshop, but I think I'd met you at something before. Yeah, I feel like I've met you before then as well. Yeah. But I, I, it, might, it probably was at Park though. The Discover Conference perhaps? No, no. I've not been to one of those. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and I'm thinking, and you were talking about, because that was, the, like you say, we met also at the subtyping. So just discussing to subtype or not to subtype. Mm -hmm. um, and I fall very much on the the not to subtype. Um, but like, yes, yeah, so that was quite an interesting um conference that we attended okay so we've got about 20 people in lovely okay so I think if you're happy to um we can start so yeah so this is going to be half presentation and then half discussion um and and or Q&A so if anyone in the um 
uh, comment section would like to ask any questions of Mary. So have a, a consideration while Mary's presenting, if there's anything that comes up for you. And then Harry's in the comment section, manning it so that I can actually ask Mary after. So I'm gonna disappear and I will come back when Mary's all done. Um, so I can see your screen just fine, just so you know that you're sharing, okay? Okay, that's not what I'm trying to do. Give me a moment. No, that's fine. Yeah. I always feel like we need um, music of <laughs> our own. Yeah. Let me see, how do I go into view? There it is. Okay, that should be about right. Fantastic, so I'm going to disappear. You should just see my slides, is that correct? You can see yes, my slides? Yes, that, that is correct, yes. Okay, super. Right. So I'm going to talk about the difficulties that we face as autistic adults and um, access and GP care mostly. Um, I'm an Irish medical doctor, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, I'm now a consultant anaesthetist, but I have also worked as a GP. So I do, um, I do have a bit of insight into that, that, that perspective as well. Um, first, I'm going to explain a bit of background to the work that I've been doing in this area. Um, and then I'll talk about some surveys that I did. The first one was with autistic adults at Autscape uh, the year before last, and the second one was online, um, which included parents and controls um, as well as autistic adults. And I'm also doing a third one on uh, mental health, uh, which I'm currently working on. So where did this all start? For those of you who don't know, As I Am is Ireland's national autism uh, charity and advocacy organization. And in uh, Back in 2018, uh, Clonakilty in County Cork was designated as Ireland's first autism friendly town. And I was involved, I was asked to get involved in the healthcare side of that. Um, and the targets were, the targets were pretty strict. Um, it included 50% of the local healthcare providers committing to the project. Um, and I was asked to uh, deliver um, the training for the healthcare providers. And as part of doing that, I did some research. I was absolutely horrified to discover the sickness and death rates for autistic people, um, which I knew nothing about previously. So if you haven't heard about our mortality statistics, including our suicide risks, this could be upsetting. It does come with a big trigger warning if you haven't heard this before. This was a large study in Sweden um, looking at early death in autistic people. It was a huge study. They looked at 27,000 autistic people um, and what they found was that autistic people died on average 16 years earlier, and that's people without um, a co-occurring intellectual disability. The leading causes of death were heart disease, suicide and epilepsy. Um, but the mortality rate was two and a half times the general population rate. And there's been similar data since from other studies from Scotland, the US and Australia as well. And also, an recent paper shows that our in-hospital mortality rate is, is, is doubled. Just to go back to the um, average life expectancy there, 70 years for the general population, 54 in the autistic group. Um, those who also had cognitive disabilities had an average life expectancy of just under 40 years. That was absolutely shocking. Um, looking at the suicide, autistic women were 13 times more likely to take their lives compared to non-autistic women men six times, giving an overall rate of nine times higher than the general population. So I, when I was preparing for this training, I wanted it to include the views of our own community. Um, so back at Oth in Autscape uh, 2018, um, I did a survey um, and a discussion workshop, which asked, what do you wish your, your doctor, your GP knew about autism? These are the questions. We asked what were the barriers faced, what do our GPs need to know, what works well, and what would make visits easier. I got 75 responses, which was fabulous. Um, the most common, commonly stated barrier was difficulty using the telephone. So people weren't even getting to appointments because um, of difficulties using the phone. Which I had no idea that, that even at that stage, I didn't realize that that was an autistic thing, even though I share it myself. Um, sensory difficulties as well, difficulty waiting in a noisy, crowded waiting area, um, and executive functioning issues, diff just difficulty planning appointments in advance. 
So I just then did an informal Facebook poll just to see if this was a, a significant issue. And I asked, just in a couple of Facebook groups, have you ever delayed, avoided, or failed to make a GP appointment when you needed to, specifically because of difficulties relating to using the phone? And in less than 24 hours, I had 18 people saying no and 159 people saying yes. And there was a lot of comments about how difficult using the phone was. So I just wanted to find out how significant an issue it was in the wider community. So um, I set up a, another survey um, looking at barriers to accessing healthcare in the autism community. And I wanted to compare the responses from autistic people with parents of autistic kids and also to include um, a control group. Um, so the online survey I it was hosted on, on, on Google forums and I, it was, um, went out through Facebook and Twitter mostly. Um, got a great response. We got 860 responses, uh, most of whom were autistic um, and, and three quarters of whom had a formal diagnosis. Um, most responses were from Ireland and the UK, um, but we had responses uh, from all over the world and uh, top marks to anyone who spots the typo. Um, age data, this compares the age data in the autistic and the control groups. Um, the parent group data isn't shown because many of the parent respondents um, gave the age of their child instead of their own age, despite the fact that they were asked to, asked to respond regarding their own healthcare experiences. Um, but then when we looked at gender, um, this is interesting. The vast majority of responses across all three groups were women, um, as is common with online surveys. But look at the proportion of the autistic group identifying as non-binary. That was 16.5%, um, which is in purple, and 1.8% uh, preferred not to say. 4.5% of the control group identified as non-binary and none of the parents. So we asked, do you have difficulty visiting your doctor when you need to? So not in general, but when a visit is actually required and over three quarters of the autistic group, half of the parents and a third of the control said yes, they had difficulty. Interestingly, the parent group had difficulty going to a GP because of problems with childcare um, and for the control group, it was mostly finding the time to go. This is looking at difficulties for all respondents according to how common they are for us. The most common issue, difficulty deciding if uh, symptoms warrant a visit um, was similar across the groups, but difficulty using the telephone to book an appointment was the single greatest barrier uh, to visiting a doctor when a visit was needed. Um, and that was cited by 61.9% of the autistic respondents. You can just see the difference there. Um, looking more closely at that telephone issue, people were asked about their preferred means of communication and which means they avoided. Autistic people avoid verbal communication, whether face-to-face, -face, which is 30%, by telephone, 77.9%, or voicemail, 61%. So the latter two really showing a significant problem with telephone communication. 55.8% of the autistic respondents said that they would avoid making a GP appointment or avoid going to see a doctor when they needed to because of not feeling understood. This is shocking to me as a doctor, because if over half of our autistic patients delay or do not attend when unwell, because we as doctors don't understand them, and clearly there's a lot of work that we have to do to increase knowledge and understanding of autism within the medical profession. Communicating with the doctor during the appointment was difficult for 53.1%. For Difficulty with the reception staff, a significant factor also at 46.4%. An online booking system was the preferred means of making an appointment across all groups, but it should be simple and user friendly as 20.1% of the autistic group found the booking system uh, confusing. And if it requires a phone call a call back, then it's utterly pointless. Looking at difficulties experienced by autistic people who took the survey, who would delay or avoid a visit? As I said, difficulty using the telephone uh, to book the appointment, not feeling understood, difficulty communicating with the doctor, long wait to get an appointment that was just under 50%, the waiting room environment also around 50%, difficulty planning appointment, an appointment in advance and no online booking system. Um, also difficulty communicating with the reception staff, that was 46%, inability to see, an, to see a known or preferred doctor, 
um, again, just under 50%. Not having enough time to visit the doctor for a third of us, needing a support person to come with us, it was 20%. Difficulty waiting to see the doctor, and it, as I mentioned, the online booking, booking system. Not having anyone to look after a child was an issue for 13% of the autistic uh, respondents. Um, when we asked how often communication difficulties were encountered during um, a consultation, 21.4% um, of the autistic respondents replied all the time. When we included those answering frequently or sometimes, that brings it up to 91.9% .9 of us having difficulties communicating. Um, and again, look at the blues, the parents, the greens, the control group, you know, sometimes rarely, not at all. Um, the differences are very obvious when you look at that, uh, that, that chart. Um, these are the specific aspects of, communi uh, of communication which are difficult during the consultation and the autistic group um, is in pink. 77.9% of us said anxiety makes it harder to communicate. And this is true for us in all aspects of life. Um, specific measures to reduce our anxiety around healthcare would help enormously um, and significantly impact our healthcare. Concern and not being believed or not being taken seriously is a huge barrier. Because some of us don't attend, even when seriously ill, which I'll talk about in a minute, this is a really important issue to look at. Um, autistic communication differences can call, cause particular challenges in healthcare. Expressing emotions differently, for example, appearing to be angry when afraid or in pain, or describing pain without the expected nonverbal signs of pain can lead a doctor to underestimate the level of distress. Pain's a huge issue for us. Um, I'll skip that for now, though. We might get a chance to come back to it. Um, one in six stated that they were scared of the receptionist. Um, and again, look at the differences between the groups for, for none of the above. Planning difficulties or executive functioning issues can often be a problem for us. Um, finding it difficult to prioritize um, medical problems, needing to give the whole story and not, not, not leave anything out. That's, that often comes across as over-inclusiveness and it's difficulty knowing what is serious, what's not, what to include, what to leave out, difficulty summarizing, um, and just a sense of needing to give the whole story. Um, and I think that's probably familiar to, to most of us, but it can be a real challenge, particularly in a short appointment. Um, and as a healthcare provider, I know it can be difficult to manage. Um, but being able to email in advance a list of what of the concerns, what the appointment is for, um, would very effectively deal, deal with this issue. Routines are really important to us. And it's important for um, my peers in healthcare to understand that how, how, how important routines are, are for us um, and to consider that when prescribing treatment for any condition, in particular in relation to lifestyle changes. Again, the difficulties we face in managing to arrange and attend a medical appointment are simply not understood or not experienced by um, non-autistic people. Um, so it is, it, it is very hard to, to get people to understand these issues. Sensory problems were, as we'd expect, a noisy, crowded, smelly waiting room and with bright fluorescent lights, it's a sensory hell for any of us. Sensitivity to touch is a, um, is a problem. And that's whether, it can, whether it's an unexpected touch or the expected touch um, of a physical exam. Uh, we find it difficult to know how long we'll wait, what's gonna happen during the consultation, which doctor we'll see, how long the consultation will last. And in contrast, parents identify difficulty only with knowing, really, mostly with knowing how long they would wait. So what helps? Everyone preferred online booking. So that's another example of making adaptations for us, which benefit everyone. But next most important was the ability to email in advance the reason for the visit. Being allowed to wait outside should be easy to arrange, arrange particularly now after our experience with COVID. Um, and the same for arranging an appointment at the start or the end of a clinic. Let's look at the differences between the autistic and the parent groups in terms of disclosure. Non-autistic parents generally ensure that the GP is aware of the child's diagnosis with only 8% um, uncertain. In the autistic group, almost one in five hide their diagnosis. And interestingly, another one in five are unsure if their GP is aware. 
So there's clearly a large amount of work to be done around increasing understanding um, of autism amongst my medical colleagues. But also, if we don't tell our doctors that we're autistic, it's harder for them to help us. Let's look at the consequences of what happens because of all these problems not getting healthcare. Two thirds of us have had both physical and mental health conditions remain untreated because of inability to access healthcare. Half of us were referred to a specialist but didn't attend. And almost two and three were told they should have seen a doctor sooner. 37% had to undergo more extensive treatment or surgery than if they had attended sooner. Most worryingly, one in three did not seek treatment for a potentially serious or life-threatening condition. And attending for screening is worryingly low. And there was a similar pattern for parents of autistic uh, children. Sometimes the reason we don't get the care we need is because we, we're isolated and we don't have the support that we need. The health services generally work on the assumption that patients have friends and families who will support them, who will bring them to appointments, who will collect them after surgery, for example, um, who look after them. That's not always the case for us, and that can have negative effects on our health too. And those of us in healthcare simply assume that patients are in the system and that they will come to us when they're unwell, but that's not necessarily true for us. Um, which came, came through really clearly in the survey. Um, we might not be even getting the most basic of healthcare. Um, and we really, we urgently need more research in this. Um, for a lot of people, it's because of previous healthcare trauma. Other reasons might be a previous GP retiring, dying, moving away, people moving from one location to another and just never managing to get registered um, with a GP practice. And then when unwell, it's just too difficult to, to, to do then. Some of the stories I've heard through doing this research have been absolutely heartbreaking. And as a doctor, to learn that medically serious conditions are going untreated because of something as simple as an accessible way of booking an appointment is just appalling. We'd never, like, we'd never allow a wheelchair user, for example, to be excluded from services for the lack of a wheelchair ramp or a lift. We have to get the message out there. We have to recognize that for us, for the autistic population, an alternative means of communication is just as important as a wheelchair ramp is for a wheelchair user. This was a study looking at hospital emergency departments. Um, the autistic uh, cohort were three times as likely to have a serious condition, three times as likely to be admitted following attending an emergency department and three times as likely to die during that admission. Is this because autistic people delay seeing their own doctor or don't have a doctor? We really need more research in this. Um, we know that access to mental health services is difficult. Some of you will recognize this work by Sonny Hallett and Catherine Crompton. Um, and that inspired um, a follow-up survey, which uh, I conducted at Autscape in 2019. Um, and some of you may have heard me present the preliminary results at Autscape this year, and um, hopefully we'll publish that next year. But what we need to do is we need to talk about what we can do about this. Um, we need to raise, the, raise awareness with our peers within the community, because a lot of people don't realize that this is a thing for us. They don't realize, I didn't realize that the difficulties that I had using the telephone were common to so many of us, for example. So are you registered with the GP? That's the first, first and foremost, that's the most important, um, important issue to make sure. And if not, can we help each other to get registered? Because sometimes it's easier to do things for each other or for other people than it is to do it for ourselves. Next most important, I believe, is to make sure that your GP knows that you're autistic and knows what that means for you. We need to be aware of the appointment issues and just find ways around phone appointments. Attending for screening, so important. Um, I've previously given this talk and said, if you're overdue, please do that this week. It's maybe a little different now with, um, with the COVID situation, um, but please don't neglect that. And, and again, know your normal. Um, examine your breasts regularly, examine your testes regularly, know what is normal for your body, know your skin, recognize differences. 
um, and changes. Because with this awareness comes responsibility. And while healthcare providers, we need to certainly improve education, training, and change our practice for ourselves, for us as the autistic community, we can't wait for that to happen. Um, we, have, we have to look after each other and look after our community and look after our families and just realize that, the, that this is a massive issue for our communities. Families, we need to teach our young people um, about, about healthcare seeking behavior. So many of us are ignoring symptoms. I know people who have ignored bleeding, abnormal bleeding for months, um, unidentified lumps and bumps. Please get those checked out. Please don't ignore symptoms. Even if you're not sure whether or not it needs a visit, just go and see, because that's not your job. That's the job of the medical providers to know whether or not something is, is, is serious. Um, those of us who are getting on a bit, we need to plan our elder care. Um, so I would suggest um, a, a specific consultation with your GP. Now, again, things are very different now because of COVID, things are much harder. And I'm, I'm really worried about the reliance on telephone um, consultation. I'm really worried about the impact of that on our community. But in normal conditions, I would suggest making a specific appointment and say, I am autistic. Our mortality is increased. We don't receive basic healthcare. And I would like to discuss our approach to my healthcare going forward. I need an alternative to telephones, to wait outside of my car until it's my turn, to not be touched unless absolutely necessary or whatever, because all of our needs in, in, in this situation, they're, they're different. And it's important for our doctors, particularly our regular doctors, to get to know us and to understand what it is that we do need. Um, when I talk to GPs about this, I suggest an alternative appointment system, accepting a concise problem list by email, because that will help everybody. Um, an option to wait outside. It, it, certainly before Corona, it was seen as quite difficult to do that. It was an imposition on the reception staff to call somebody when it was their turn. Coronavirus changed everything for us in, in, in healthcare. That's no longer ever going to be um, an excuse. Similarly, we should easily be able to organize the first or last appointments. Uh, written instructions um, that relates to follow up because a lot of us have difficulty with follow up. Um, we can forget what was said, we can forget the advice, um, filling prescriptions, that sort of thing is quite difficult. So having that in writing is really helpful. Another thing is to send referrals directly, not to give us a, a, a letter for another doctor in an envelope and expect us to post it. Um, it's so much easier if the referral can be made from the GP surgery directly. Um, again, it's not that big a deal. Um, and, and the other thing following on to that is to make a follow-up appointment um, on the day of attendance if, if, if necessary. Annual health checks um, are currently offered to those with an intellectual disability. There is work underway at the moment to extend that to the autistic community more generally. Um, I'm hopeful that that, that, that will improve our um, healthcare outcomes. Um, but ideally, I'd love to go in, I'd love to see us go into a GP and be asked, do you have a list for me? Or even better, I received your list. I think problem, whatever is the priority, do you agree? Having that sort of a communication um, would really help in, in uh, the consultation. What else can we do? Other things that I suggest to GPs, don't insist on phone calls, use clear, direct language, encouraging positive routines, because we can use our need for routine to our, to our benefit um, if, we, if, we, if we need to. Um, encouraging our special interests, prescribing solitude. I love this. I love, and I love the discussion that comes after that, because we have, most of us, an absolute need for solitude, um, which a lot of non-autistic people find very difficult to understand. Um, prescribe for sensory needs, very important. Fidget tools, they're not toys, fidget tools. Um, sunglasses, um, ear defenders, um, noise cancelling headphones, really, really important. And very important if GPs are aware of this, also particularly the occupational therapists. Um, I've lost count of the number of professionals um, involved in our care who simply are unaware of the benefit, for example, of even noise cancelling headphones. Um, we need to change that. Um, most importantly, promoting a positive self-image. 
Um, because GPs really need to understand the power, all healthcare providers, just the power of the words used, because we need to, we need to change the landscape within medicine, within healthcare, so that a positive message around autism is transmitted. And we, we, people just resist that tragedy narrative um, because it's so, it's so important. Um, yeah, here's another example of things that, that, that we, we really say all the time. <clears throat> and I'm guilty too. Um, you know, hop over to the table. Do you want to take your shirt off? No. Do you want to take a seat? I don't know if that's a good idea. That's something that we say quite a lot when we mean don't do that. That's, that's a bad idea. But using confusing language without clarifying um, can be really problematic in a healthcare uh, consultation. Um, as I mentioned, I'm an anaesthetist. When, I, when I've got caught out with this, I'm going to put you to sleep. And that was quite unfortunate um, with a child who had recently lost a beloved pet. Um, yeah, I don't use that now. Um, for those of us who are parents, carers or teachers, we need to really build capacity to access help early, to teach the importance of um, health care. And to build relationships with healthcare providers, appointment making, teach the value of screening and um, supporting people to attend appointments. Um, and as I said, having introductory appointments, all hugely valuable. So in summary, 78% of autistic respondents avoid using the telephone and it's our most common barrier to healthcare access. Over half of us avoid or delay a GP visit because of not feeling understood. The consequences of access barriers to healthcare include untreated physical conditions, untreated mental health conditions, late presentations, emergency admissions, more extensive treatment or surgery. And many of us have no access at all to primary healthcare. And based on this research, I believe these are the most important factors which underlie the excess morbidity and mortality in the adult autistic community and are the most important to, uh, to address. That's you know me from Twitter, um, where you'll often see tweets like this, because overall, my research so far has led me to this viewpoint, optimal, optimal outcomes, a content and healthy autistic adult. Um, my main concerns are our healthcare and our mortality statistics, um, and in particular, our mental health. And that starts with reframing the tragedy narrative around autism and promoting a positive self-image and a neurodiversity perspective within medicine. Um, so thanks for listening. Happy to take any questions, although I can't give specific or individual medical advice here, uh, but anything general, I'm happy to chat about. Thanks. Sorry, just sorting out my camera. There we go, fantastic, thank you. Um, I, I even I've, I've made some notes for myself because I was like, oh, oh, um, as I was listening. Um, <coughs> largely, I, I've had a look in the comments and it's mostly sadly people um, discussing poor, um, you know, services and things where they've experienced yeah, some I problems. Um, and I see a comment that says um, this information is outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Do Dr. Doherty. Um, it's a sadness that medicalizing of autism itself has perhaps resulted in autistics actually receiving less essential care. Um, is there a formal way you are sharing this information with GP practices? Is it something the community can help raise awareness of by writing to local surgeries perhaps? Um, and would GPs be receptive to offering diagnosed and self-identified autistics reasonable adjustments? So I guess um, the main one there was, yeah, how can can our learners potentially help get this information out there? First and foremost, tell your GP that you're autistic. That is absolutely the most, most important thing. And I know that some people do have concerns around that, um, which I do understand, but we can't make it any better within the services unless the GPs know that there is a need for, um, for change. <clears throat> so that's really important. Um, I am currently working on uh, writing this up with a view to publishing it soon. Um, so hopefully once that's available um, in the medical literature, it'll be easier to take that to your GP and share it with your GP. Because what I've noticed from, from talking to GPs is they've had no training in autism. 
they don't understand. They just, you know, there's never been, um, they, they've never really had much awareness, or, you know, awareness campaigns or, um, and they just don't know what to do. They don't know aut autistic adults. And they tend to think in terms of autistic children or, you know, people with significant needs. And um, most of them that I've come across have been absolutely open to this information and really determined to change their practice to meet our needs. Um, and I think collaboratively, we can definitely um, improve the situation very much. The other thing that we need to do is we need to campaign to have a voice on um, as a community on the um, any awareness training that is happening, the, the upcoming Oliver McGowan mandatory training, for example, uh, for healthcare staff. You know, um, we don't know the content of that yet. We can only hope. Um, but the autistic voice needs to be centered in that in that discussion. And I think only by activism within the community um, will that you know that that will happen. Um, certainly we are active as a group of autistic doctors. It's not just me, there's loads of us at this point. Um, and we're very much trying to raise that within medicine as, as a collective. Um, so hopefully things will change, although it's slow, it's frustratingly slow. And in terms of the mandatory training, um, I would say if you are an individual, if you're an autistic person with a good grasp on um, autistic narrative so the alternate to the medical perspective um, and your so basically Harry's three pillars we're, we're very um, up on Harry's three pillars which is understanding yourself as an autistic person understanding the different narratives not not just particularly one narrative about autistic experience so both the medical narrative and the neurodivergent one for instance um, and also knowing other autistic people so that we're not just an island um, it might be beneficial to actually see if your local NHS and council are currently setting up um, sessions discussing what's happening with that mandatory training so there's actually two um, so where I am I've got the Kent County Council and then you've got the Medway Council and they're very close to one another mm. and I've been sitting in on both mm. Um, they, they're, they're in discussions with autistic people and other professionals at this very moment to see what exactly should services look like, what can be, how can they be improved. And so obviously I've been there explaining things like um, potentially the need for advocates, so autistic advocates who are trained to then and, and I don't mean in the term, terms that we typically hear about autistic advocates. I mean, trained people who perhaps work in and with the NHS so that if you do have to go into hospital, is there somebody there who can liaise with you and <clears throat> kind of um, translate al almost how you're at, what needs you have? Because somebody in the comments section mentioned they had a good experience recently. So while a lot of the experiences, sadly, on here um, are quite poor or problematic um let me find the comment sorry oh I might have lost it this is the problem when comments go quite quickly but somebody was explaining they had a relatively good experience and that was because there was oh there it is an advocate helped them write a one-page profile about what they could do to help them um and so I know there's discussion on the um uh medical passports mm -hmm. but they really are uh yeah. hit and miss Yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah. I'm really excited to hear that you're in Medway and you're near Medway, Medway in Kent because there is a fantastic campaign that has just started in Medway and Kent in the hospital called Different Not Less. Not sure if you've heard about it. Yeah, is that um, what, well? We were on. I, that might have been the one where we were on the um, program to discuss what the title was going to be. So is that literally just been dis yeah. decided? Yeah. Uh, oh no, 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 it's been, it has been launched. Um, it was started by uh, Ginny Brobick, uh, Bobrick, sorry, who is a vascular surgeon in Medway in Kent. Um, and she's the mum of autistic twins. Um, and she's an absolute ally to our community. Um, and she started this awareness campaign. So it's very similar to the NHS rainbow campaign. So there's a badge. The NHS staff love badges. So there is a badge and it's um, 
there is staff training, there is lots of promotional materials available. Um, and it's just about celebrating neurodiversity. Um, it's just fabulous. It's, and I think it will be incredibly um, powerful within, within that trust. And the hope is that that will be rolled out um, to other trusts as well. Um, so yeah, I'd suggest people have a look at that. Uh, different, not less, Medway, Medway and Kent. Um, it's excellent. Yeah. And yeah, and, and so my my suggestion is, while that's we've got that here, are your own local um, councils and NHS doing these kinds of initiatives? Because this is the problem, is that it's in the UK anyway. Obviously, I know we've, we've got a number of people who watch um, outside the UK, but in the UK, it's very much individual and whoever just decides to take something up or you know uh, it's not regulated uh in exactly the same way dependent on the council and the nhs trust um so i was just seeing some of the other comments so we had um what training do doctors get about autism as a nurse it was mentioned once in a lecture very very little i mean there is a study um, which I think came out in 2015, looking at the GP's knowledge of autism and a very large proportion said that they'd never had any training on autism. Um, that is starting to change a little bit. There is um, a little bit more interest, um, particularly in the medical school. So I think those coming, coming behind will certainly have a bit more than you know previous generations of medics. Um, but no, there's very, very little. So it's up to individual, um, individual doctors um to access access training themselves really um otherwise I have, very, very asked, I have left cards with my gp <laughs> surgery to say that i can deliver training um because my i i put off i did something you're not supposed to do and i stayed with my old gp um while though i'd moved out of the area um for about three years until they cottoned on because I was putting off getting a new GP who didn't understand that I was autistic. I'd found one GP in my surgery who understood, you know, my anxiety around them messing up my anxiety meds and things like that. And, you know, I didn't want to lose that GP who, who'd actually made an effort to understand me. Um, so, but yes, yeah, so I'm moving to the new surgery. Um, and the first, you know, explained to the, the GP on the phone because this was during lockdown um, why I was up calling. And that was about extreme fatigue that I've experienced for years, but it's getting worse um, and explained I was autistic. And she was asking me questions about being autistic, which is great. But at the same time, I was like, you're taking up my 10 minutes with something that actually you potentially could know already um, kind of thing. So, yeah, I am. Yeah, poking people where you can to get training. Yeah, it is really frustrating um, because the level of basic knowledge amongst GPs about autism is incredibly poor. Um, and they know it and they're asking for training, um, which, it, which is great. They're also becoming much more open to people asking for referral for diagnostic assessment. And that's another thing. Um, until the GPs start to report back that there is a need for increased access to services um, by demand from the community. Um, there's no reason for those services to, to, to grow. So, um, you know, we need to be asking our GPs to refer us on for, for assessment rather than just assuming, oh, there's no services or, you know, it's a several year wait. So there's no point. There is a point. <clears throat> um, yeah. Um, I had another one um, that hold on let me find it that was asking okay uh, so michael kingsley was asking and said thank you um you mentioned planning for elderly care that they're 61 and this is an area which concerns them how can they plan that's a whole other talk okay yeah um but it is very very it, it is very difficult it's very concerning what i would say that is very positive is in the few years that I've been around the autistic community, I'm noticing a huge amount of interest in that area now. So there's a lot of research happening when like five years ago, there was nothing, yeah. you know, absolutely nothing. Nobody had even considered the issue. So at least it's, it is being looked at now. And hopefully by the time we need, we need to access that care, um, there might be some autism friendly um, settings that we could potentially consider. 
And when you say that's a whole other talk, do you actually have a whole other talk? Because <laughs> what no. we did, okay, just checking. Because <laughs> what we tend to do as well is um, basically a lot of our sessions are led by what learners want to learn. So um, we could certainly look at it at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's absolutely fine. Um, where are we? We've got somebody. Malaya or Malaya or Malia, I'm sorry if I'm saying the name incorrectly. They're talking about Tylenol, so I'm assuming that's America. Is that likely to be America? So they're just describing the issue with so called adult medication because it's sens sensory wise, it's revolting, it's very difficult to take. Tablets are difficult to take. I still struggle to take tablets, yeah. um, and I have to take a tablet every day. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they said what. I don't think you can necessarily answer this per se, but why do all adult medications have to be horrible and cause so much anxiety to try and take? Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah. Um, for that particular reason, I taught my son specifically how to swallow tablets. Um, and I started with little bits of fruit because uh, he liked fruit. And I started to get him to um, take a small little tablet sized piece of fruit and swallow it without chewing it. And then went to something like a piece of sweet or whatever. And th the trick was to get him to swallow it without chewing it. Um, but because it was something he liked to eat, it was no big deal if he didn't manage it. And now he's no problem to, because he wouldn't take liquid medication. Um, he just couldn't manage that from a sensory point of view. So I needed to get him taken tablets sooner than I might have otherwise. Um, and that worked quite well. But yeah, I mean, Tylenol, paracetamol, it is disgusting. But there's the capsules. I mean, I, I would take capsules myself rather than um, tablets because tablets taste so horrible. But then capsules are very plasticky as well. So It really depends, doesn't it? Because there's certain brands of things where it's like a cap lit. So it's not so powdery. Because my issue is it takes me so long, they end up dissolving on your tongue anyway, and then it's disgusting. Um, or I choke because sadly... I have issues with my uvula I'm very aware of it so I end up gagging on whatever the, the thing is um but that's actually quite a useful if nobody knew that already that's quite a nice little tip which mm. is potentially could you try with something that's um like a soft piece of fruit if you're okay with fruit of some description so that's a nice little tip actually um got Leanne Lewis asking please can hospital consultants also be targeted for training especially in A&E being told that you don't look autistic when in A&E with COVID-19 just adds to the anxiety yeah no absolutely it is um it's really really difficult the emergency department environment is a nightmare for anybody but for an autistic person it is just so much worse a couple of places are trying to do things differently. And I've I've recently heard some good stories, which is nice, you know, adults going in because um, a lot of the kids hospitals have started doing programs. But it's nice to hear about adults going in and being able to say to the triage nurse, for example, that they're autistic and, you know, they're brought into somewhere quieter. And it's just simply, you know, people, staff understanding that noise and busy places, busy waiting rooms are, are a real difficulty for us. Um, it's it's so slow. It really is slow, but one of the things that I'm finding is the most effective way actually of getting through to my colleagues around all this is to talk to them about my other area of advocacy, which is with uh, autistic doctors. So I founded a peer support group for autistic doctors or autistic, uh, autistic doctors international. Um, we're mostly on Facebook, you know, WhatsApp groups and, um, zooming a lot over over lockdown but it's a group that's grown quite rapidly and it's an issue that has grabbed the attention of universities hospitals medical schools in various countries um, and i'm actually quite blown away by the level of interest that we have at the moment um, and what i'm finding is that doctors are very keen to listen about this um, much more so to listen about autistic doctors than they are to listen to me talk about our healthcare issues. Um, but I find that being able to talk about the autistic doctor issues gives me an open door to talk about us and as a community and our healthcare issues. 
Um, so I'm finding linking those two aspects of advocacy really, really interesting. <clears throat> and I think if, uh, if it wasn't for the doctor's angle, um, I wouldn't be having half as much success um, in terms of raising awareness around autistic healthcare issues as I am. Um, so the, but the autistic <coughs> doctors mm -hmm. sort of advocacy, what, what, what exactly is that about? So is that about raising awareness of the struggles well, we started off. We started off as a peer support network, basically. Um, I founded this about a year and a half ago. It was kind of I had taken a career break um, after my son was diagnosed, so I've been off for a few years. So I was looking at going back into clinical practice. Um, I'd never knowingly worked as an uh, as an autistic doctor because I was diagnosed while I was while I was on career break. So it was quite a daunting pro, um, prospect, really, going back after after so long. Um, and knowing I was autistic because I mean like at the time I got my diagnosis I didn't even know could you be autistic and be a doctor you know um, of course you can but I didn't know that then um, so I was really struggling to connect with um, other autistic doctors like I knew I couldn't be the only one um, but it was the sort of thing that even if people you know kind of suspected that somebody might be autistic it was this it certainly wasn't talked about um, so then I linked up with um, and one colleague and then found someone else and then someone else. And, and then there was about six of us. So I started the group and then we really very quickly grew to about 20. Um, and then we just grew to 30 and 50 and 100. And now we're over 200. There's over 200 of us um, in the group um, internationally. Uh, most are in the UK, but we have people from everywhere all over the world. and. It's been fabulous because what I found, there, there's aspects of being a doctor that are just, you can only really discuss it with other doctors in the same way as there's aspects of being autistic that you can only really discuss with other autistic people. Um, and I just found that I needed, I needed both. And to find other autistic doctors was, was just great. So what we do now, we started off with peer support we've kind of moved into a bit of advocacy. We've done some work around um, supporting some of our members, say through exams, through career transitions. Um, we've had some, we've had some pretty um, interesting results with one of the colleges where they actually, um, one of our members was, was removed from training and it was because they were autistic and that's what they were told. Um, so we as a group, we, cha we challenged that decision um, and got that decision overturned and got an apology for that doctor. I was going to say, and surely that's illegal. Yes, but they don't realise. They had no idea that it was possible to be autistic and be a doctor. I got an email two days ago, even from a different specialty, um, from one of our members. Can you please contact my educational supervisor and tell him that it is possible to be a consultant and be autistic? Um, people just don't realise. And that's really problematic as well, because there are actually I mean, it, I had a it's a relatively old documentary now, but, you know, doctors can be voice here as an experienced psychosis as well. And so sure. people have such a poor understanding of people's capabilities yeah. based yeah. on something that's not considered neurotypical. Um, I'm just having another look and see if there's any other potentially good um, questions to grab. Um, sorry, just while I'm reading. That's OK. So a lot of people just describing, yeah, problematic yeah, I, areas. I know. And so many people have had some horrendous, I mean, some of the stories that I have heard, I mean, people with really serious, serious medical problems, um, just unable to access care or unable to make themselves be believed, or in particular, one of the big issues is pain um, and describing pain because... <clears throat> As doctors, we're taught to assess pain, both by what the patient says, but also by how the patient looks and how the patient responds when examined. But for autistic people, quite often, we don't display the same nonverbal signs of pain, nor do we often say, ouch, when something hurts, because nobody's told us that. If, that's you've, ever seen, if, you've, ever, if you've ever seen me having a tattoo done, <clears throat> you wouldn't know I'm being tattooed. Okay. And that's a, you know, I'm trying to think the, the, I've only got two tattoos, but the last one I had mm, maybe over half an hour, which is not particularly long for a tattoo, if I'm honest, but that's a long time to be stabbed with a needle repeatedly 
yes which makes you bleed yeah. and I pretty much looked like I was asleep yeah I make no sound no yeah. no response whatsoever yeah and the problem is if you get that in an emergency department um that is really problematic and it's really problematic for my medical colleagues because a lot of people who would not present who would whose nonverbal presentation would be incongruous with what they're saying um that's a real red flag in terms of management management of that situation so unless you know that somebody is autistic um it's very easy to misinterpret that um and it is definitely something that needs that that needs a lot of research luckily i there are some people starting to get interested in this and there are you know looking at pain responses in autistic people and hopefully more research um you know will be done and will be helpful well i'm gonna i'm gonna grab onto a couple of my notes that i'd made i just wanted to make sure i got through as many of the sort of key or questions or comments that people might have made um but obviously you're welcome afterwards to go back through if you're interested and see if there's any um ones that you wanted to comment um directly to but while i yeah so while i was listening i already knew we'd already mentioned before as well about the issues with the phone and how that's the biggest barrier did at any point it come up in terms of what is it about the phone for us that is a problem yeah we didn't specifically look at that in the study but personally i think it is well, actually one of my um collaborators stuart nielsen has a beautiful way of describing it that the phone is the distilled essence of everything that is difficult about communication for us um it's the lack of visual cues, I think. Um, it's a disembodied voice. Mm. It's the unpredictability. If I'm making the phone call, who's going to answer? If I'm answering a phone call, if I don't recognize the number, well, if I don't recognize the number, I just don't pick up. There's just no question. But, you know, it's just that unpredictability. The unpredictability of the conversation, it's not scripted. Um, and also it is from my end I do tend to in my head I've scripted what I want to say but the issue is the response you'll get even with as much planning I'm very good at right if they say this where are we going to go with that and then you end up with all these branches which is exhausting totally. um, yeah but yeah it's a lot of energy to make yeah. a phone call and then timing as well knowing when it's our turn to speak when we've stopped speaking when it's you know it's it's just so so difficult like I if I have a phone call to make, it can take every spoon I have for an entire day on a bad day. Um, well, on a bad day, I suppose I wouldn't do it. But you know what I mean? It can really take so much energy out of me. Having said that, I do it at work when I have to. I, I But then again, I will walk from one end of the hospital to the other to speak to a colleague face to face rather than phone them. Yeah. Um, and I before, like before I knew I was autistic, I didn't realize that why I was doing that whereas now I can you know I can easily um, let a colleague know or I'll just text somebody um, and while I know it's very different for different autistic people um, because I run social um, groups and things like that on and obviously it has to be online at the moment I and I'm always exhausted by zoom I still think I would prefer it if my GP offered zoom because at the moment my appointments are having to be online obviously um sorry via phone call unless I actually have to go in for like a blood test or something um so to have it on zoom would actually be preferable to yeah. just phone call because like you say yes you've got those visual cues i can yeah that so potentially that would be easier for me but i know there's plenty of autistic people who do not like to be on zoom yeah. in any capacity but then there's also the option to use the chat function mm -hmm. in zoom or in those, which is a, a more immediate response than obviously emailing your issues and things like that. Um, I'm just having a look at the other things I noted because I was thinking I've called on behalf of autistic students in crisis before, so I can manage it for somebody else. That's exactly why I say if you're not if you're not registered with a GP, can we help each other to get registered? Because we can do these kind of things for someone. I, I can't explain that, but yeah. it does seem to be fairly consistent, you know, that um, amongst autistic people that I know, it's much easier to do something for someone else than to do it mm. for ourselves. Mm. You just have that that mm. 
re you're yeah. removed from the situation somewhat and so I've done that for several students I've had to phone on their behalves because you know they're, they're struggling with it and they're in, in crisis mm -hmm. um, and you know currently I'm putting off making up a follow-up follow appointment to my own GP like I said I had a load of blood tests done to see if there's any I do this regularly, but there's never anything um, why I'm so fatigued all the time. And I really do need to make a follow up appointment and say, right, can we look into this more? Because this is, you know, I'm 36 now and I've been exhausted all my life. I need there needs to be something else other than me just being autistic. I don't think it's enough anymore to just think I'm just anxious all the time, for instance. But I'm putting it off because it'll be on the phone. They yeah. don't have yeah. you know, online appointments. Yeah. And that's why we asked, do you avoid or delay? Because it's that issue of putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. I mean, personally, I had an appointment that I had to cancel um, because of something unexpected. And I delayed and delayed and delayed rearranging that appointment for a whole year until I went to my GP for something else. And she said, well, what happened about such and such a thing? It's like, oh, never kind of got around to getting, getting there. You know, and luckily she made the appointment for me. And they sent me out an appointment in the post and I turned up and, you know, I, I got whatever it was dealt with. But it's just it's just that delay, delay, delay. And the consequence of that is that autistic people tend to turn up with much more serious illness, tend to turn up with maybe much more advanced disease than maybe might have been the case if we'd gone when the symptoms started, you know, or at the beginning. Um, and that's what really concerns me about all of this. And I think that is a huge driver of our mortality and morbidity figures. It's why our mortality rates are so bad, or at least it's one of the reasons, sure, there may be specific conditions that are more prevalent, um, more common amongst autistic people, for sure. Um, but a large- think given, given technology now, there's no real reason for it to be this way. Um, no. You know, I am, um, I would much rather, so you know, when you've, I don't know, got to return something to Amazon or you've got to talk to the bank or something. I like the chat, the, the um, what would you call it? Like there's chat support, tech support mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, I can think clearly, I can type my answers, I can process the answers and process because there's a little bit of a lag from them replying. So it's all those kinds of processing things, which... I'm also thinking because I made a note um, because I do a talk on autistic well-being. So more specifically about the issues we have, the barriers we have to mental health care mm. and services. Um, and largely it's again because nobody is trained to understand how to deal with an autistic person with mental health issues. They will conflate the two. They will say, well, I can't help you because you're it's an autistic thing. No, it's not. Yeah. I'm autistic with a mental health concern. Or, and they conflate the two um, and I talk about how there's many barriers to mental health due to the challenging behavior of therapists so obviously yes if we are on the elixithymic scale to some extent so for those who aren't aware elixithymia is a difficulty inability or inability sorry to understand or process or articulate emotion um, and so obviously if you're like you say if you're being asked are you know are you in pain and what's that level of that pain and things like that in this healthcare um, setting um, that's going to be a struggle um, my um, sister was in labor for about 24 hours and you wouldn't have really known there was no real noise or pain responses um, coming from her um, and she, autistic um, obviously, like you mentioned, the communication differences and the processing speed differences. So if you've got a GP appointment that's meant to only be 10 minutes, but we process so differently and we need that time, like I say, the lag of a chat function is actually quite nice because, you know, you've got all you've reduced the sensory processing issues of a physical environment of you know what's that person's facial expressions meant to mean or, or what have you um, and you have the lag to be able to process mm -hmm. information and then obviously you surely you'd be able to maybe download your own chat and then you'd be like ah that's what they said that's what I'm supposed to go and do now I completely forgot they said I have to go to the surgery to get the blood test and you know that kind of thing um, I think technology is going to really help us 
And the other thing that's going to help us is all the changes within healthcare um, because of COVID. Um, I think we're going to actually benefit quite a lot once it's all over. Once once things settle down, I think some of the best changes will be will be kept and definitely will benefit us um, in terms of access. And I've noted this that we are finding as autistic people, as disabled people, and non-autistic but disabled people are noting that there are potentially ignoring COVID we're not talking about the pandemic itself but the lockdown situation and scenario has potentially led to some positive things for our different communities and I think non-autistic and non-disabled groups are finding it difficult to see that there are potential positives from the lockdown scenario I don't want to talk about the pandemic because that's obviously a horrible thing for people but the circumstances yeah, and mm -hmm. situations and things are, are potentially quite beneficial mm -hmm. um what's my other note that I've made I put it's interesting and key to see the barrier that we have in terms of articulating ourselves um for instance I tend to also need to explain everything because you're not sure what's not needed and you don't want to lie or miss yeah. things out or lie by omission so which bits are my story are the key bits that this doctor needs to know because in my head you need to know everything yeah, yeah absolutely that is a real it, it, it's a real life example of the double empathy problem it really is a perfect example of how we struggle to understand autistic patients as, as doctors we struggle and autistic patients don't have the perspective that a doctor would have but then no patient has the perspective that a doctor has and that's not a patient's job it's up to us as doctors to know what's important um, but what doctors need to know in terms of communicating with us is that we do have that tendency and that it's perfectly fine to say to, to to stop us once we're going you know around the same block several times that it's okay to say okay I've got that move on because sometimes it's really hard to get you know I can get stuck in that loop and I'm I'm just trying to explain and over explain and it can be very, I can see it from both sides and it's really, really difficult to manage um, from both sides of that consulting desk. And that's interesting because I actually um, created or compiled um, autistic student accommodation, sort of not accommodation per se, but there are, but it's basically a guide for supervisors at university or anybody at a university trying to um, work with or support um, in a teaching environment an autistic student and I made sort of viva adjustment guides and things like this and um, part of it was yes let the student know when they've answered the question you know because we will just keep going because we think we haven't given you the information you would have told us by now if we'd given you the information you need yeah. Um, yeah. yeah yeah yeah, no, that's so, it's so important. Yeah. But, but again, again, I mean, and, and like, we are grateful to be told that, but to non-autistic people, that's incredibly rude. Um, and they need to understand that, no, that's not rude for us. You know, they do need to be blunt and they do need to be straight with us. And, you know, once we, once, again, once we both understand each other in that consultation, um, then effective communication can happen. And that's why I think, I mean, not necessarily in a GP setting per se, but like I say, this idea of potentially of advocates, mm -hmm. autistic advocates in the NHS. Mm -hmm. um, so when you go in, they can do that translation bit because they've learned from the NHS, they've learned from the doctors, etc. what the questions actually mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they can then say to the autistic patient, OK, this is what they're asking for. You've answered it now. You know, that kind of thing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And someone just said, so interesting about this, how we have to tell the whole story. I have no idea that was an autistic thing. Have this issue in mental health appointments too. I either have to tell the story or when I go to the GP, I say none of it and only answer the question that is asked. Mm -hmm. So if they don't ask the right questions, my problem doesn't even get discovered. Exactly. And that's why it is so important for us to be able to let the GP know in advance what the problem is and why we're there. Because in the in the stress of a, of a consultation, again, if the, if the correct question isn't asked, or if we get off on a tangent, or you get an open question like, how are you? Or, you know, how did you get here? What brought you here? Which is such a stupid question that doctors are actually taught to ask. We've been taught to ask open questions. Um, 
but they're so open that they're really unhelpful for us. So if doctors know in advance why we're there, then we're not going to have a situation where people come out of a consultation um, never having mentioned the problem that brought them there in the first place. I mean, it's not quite the same, but yeah, that was, I had a similar situation trying to access mental health services when I was about 18, 17, 18, so quite a long time ago. And um, I just remember having, while I was waiting for my actual therapy, they kept having me come in to the um, mental health services, whatever it was at the time, to just check in on me. And I kept seeing different people. But one time I saw one person and she just asked the right questions. And I was like, if I could have had her for my actual therapy, I probably would have stuck with it. Yeah. You no. Know, so it's just having people who are just particularly good at asking the, the right questions, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to keep, um, keep you too much longer. Um, I'm just going to quickly, if anybody's got any questions that I didn't pick up or managed to answer, I know Harry did pin one, so I don't know if we answered that one or not, um, but I'll pick up on Bobby's now, which is, um, so do you disclose to medical professionals Professional, sorry, you are autistic if not officially d- diagnosed yet? That is an interesting question. Um, I would certainly advocate telling GPs that you consider yourself to be autistic or that you think you are autistic and ask for an assessment ask for a referral for assessment, um, most definitely, because the GPs are realizing that this is an increasing issue within their practices. Um, Several years ago, people were, GPs were very rarely asked for um, anything to do with adult autism. Um, And now they're seeing it more and more. Um, So the more that we can do that, the more that we can raise the issue amongst the GP um, population, then the quicker services will change for us. So definitely would be my advice. Fantastic, yeah. Um, And Bobby's saying that they have one, it's 18 months away as a waiting list. I think certainly if you're on a waiting list, it's it's worth mentioning. Or if you're finding it difficult, I mean, personally and on Academy, we're very much, because we don't look at autistic experience through the pathology lens, If you're autistic, you're autistic. So we don't even necessarily class it as self-diagnosis because it's just self-discovery. You are autistic kind of thing. So, but if you do feel uncomfortable discussing you being autistic, if you don't have a diagnosis with a GP, for instance, there's nothing wrong with picking the key things that you struggle with, surely, and just saying, I will struggle if without you know very specific language or very clear language so just the things that you you think you might um need them to understand so that you can have a a better appointment i guess yeah i agree definitely yeah raise raise the issue and be and be specific and again even for those of us who have um you know a formal diagnosis and our gps do know um, that we're autistic, we still need to learn for ourselves what are our specific barriers. Um, and actually, in, on that, I might suggest looking at um, an American website. It's the A Aspire. Um, it's the autistic, uh, the academic um, research collective in, in, in the States. It's uh, Christina Nicolaitis and Dora Raymaker. A lot of us will know Dora um, for her current work on burnout, which is amazing. But they've done most of the pioneering work around uh, healthcare uh, for, the, for uh, autistic people. And they have a toolkit available on their website, which you can, um, it's publicly, publicly available. So you can look through all the various barriers in terms of um, health healthcare access, and you can print you can print out a personalised assessment of your healthcare healthcare access needs. Um, Now, whether or not um, GPs in the UK would be willing to acknowledge that or accept that, um, it's hard to tell. Um, But certainly, there's work underway in the states getting that um, trialed. Um, with several healthcare systems over there. And I think I think there's a team in Newcastle here looking at a lot of the healthcare, healthcare adaptations. And I think they're looking at adapting um, a version of that toolkit uh, for use in the NHS. So certainly 
things are happening. There's a lot of exciting research happening. I think the next few years are going to see a big, big change in terms of medicine and healthcare and access for us. Um, but in the meantime, we can't wait for that. We have to take responsibility for our own healthcare needs um, and educate our GPs. And I'm sorry that we have to be the ones to do that right now, but but we do. We do because we, we can't wait. Can I ask if anybody's in the comment section, can you can you link the Aspire uh, website that Mary's talking about? So I've seen a couple of people saying they know what what she's talking about. So if you wouldn't mind popping that in the comments, that would be great. Because I'm thinking of it's almost like we need like a buddy system as well, to some extent, if we want to do it for ourselves until it's it's um, done for us appropriately in the services, because um, one of our learners um, and friend was struggling, not necessarily, um, I don't think he wanted support per se right now with the GP, um, but for helping with accessing the telephone appointments or trying to get through to like PIP assessors. So for those who aren't in the UK, PIP is, um, um, well, we won't explain in, in real terms what we think of it, but um, it's a, a way of trying to assess an individual's either disability needs or healthcare needs and things like that. And then whether they're entitled to any um, monetary support um, and things like that. But yeah, wanting basically a buddy to help with the things that, that he really struggles with. So I don't know if anything like that exists or whether we can come together and try and do that for one another. I oh, Harry's. I think we can do that ourselves. I think, you know, certainly um, maybe not in a formalized way, but certainly um, in local in, in local ways. I mean, I've helped, you know, I've s supported various autistic friends with various medical medical issues um, and uh, not not necessarily as a doctor, but just as an autistic friend who kind of understands the medical system to some degree and crucially i'm not tangled my, my brain's not fried with anxiety at the time because i'm not emotionally invested in that particular situation and i think that's the really the really difficult thing for us um and i think you know four out of five of us finding it finding anxiety makes it harder to communicate and there's nothing more more stressful than being sick and having to deal with doctors so it's no wonder that none of us are you know functioning normally or as we normal normally do um in a healthcare environment and again that's one of the points that's really important for me to get across to my medical colleagues and um, just how difficult accessing health healthcare is for us um, and that and that is that is the case i'm i'm actually I consider myself quite good in a crisis and I've been sadly I've been in hospitals many a time not for myself um, for taking my mum in um, when my mum's need, needed psychiatric care um, and I, I do go into logical mode and I kind of try and well I don't think I do it or um, I think it happens automatically I kind of go into a detached mode where it's like no this is needed to be I need to be the logical person now to deal with the things that are all problematic and deal with the system deal with the processing um, because somebody has to mm -hmm. um, and, and a similar that I mean my grand my gramps who brought me up um, when he got um, sadly got terminal cancer he um he wanted me to go to all the appointments because he knew I would listen. I, I, me being me, I made notes um, and things like that. Although at some points that was difficult, obviously, because there was still an emotional attachment, but I was there in that was my head yeah. set was I'm here to gather the information, make sense of it and figure out his next steps and things like that. So we can be, I think we can be really good. That can be a strength of many of us as long as it's not a personal situation. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, I agree. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. Somebody just made the comment that the comment that we pinned wasn't the correct one. So I think the correct comment, which I will pin now, is the one by Susie Davey um, for the Aspire Health Kit, Healthcare Toolkit for Autistic Adults. So thank you for that, um, Susie. Um, okay, fantastic. So. Um, did you have any final comments? I said, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Yeah, oh no, it's fine. I can talk about this for hours. Um, but one really, one really positive thing that's happening is that um, the network of autistic doctors is growing. We have um, an allied group for autistic medical students 
Um, there's about 50 of them at this point. Um, and that's growing too. And that will grow as we do, as we do more, more in terms of awareness. And with that, what happens is awareness within medical settings grows. I'm hoping that within a couple of years, we're going to have a network of autism aware GP surgeries throughout, throughout the country, throughout the UK, throughout Ireland, um, where it's perfectly well understood what our needs are. And we can go in there and we can go into a waiting area that's not the busy, crowded, smelly waiting area. That's not somewhere that, you know, our anxiety is ramped up so high before we ever get into the consultation. So we can't even think straight or speak or communicate. Um, I'm really hoping that things will change in, you know, over the next few years. Well, like I say, the, the fact that my local council and NHS trusts are asking for autistic input into their um service provision mm -hmm. is a good step forward um yeah so like i said one of the, the meetings i had on zoom um there was you know there was um a psychiatrist there and so i got the chance to say because he himself said they don't have training they don't know how to deal with autistic people who need mental health provision mm -hmm. um you know so i got the chance to say I'm here, have some details to like contact so that we can actually teach you what is autistic and what is mental health, <laughs> which is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so important. In fairness, the College of Psychiatrists are doing a lot of work in the last couple of years. They're doing a lot of good work in terms of raising awareness. Um, you know, they're, what they're really trying to do is upskill their, their existing cohort of, of psychiatrists um, in terms of autism and those coming through are get are starting to get training um you know so it is getting better yeah so, i hope it's from autistic people yeah <laughs> yeah that's the main thing is hoping that yeah no it is actually and the thing is there's a lot of people in healthcare who are autistic but who don't necessarily disclose um, just because the, the culture has been so stigmatizing that, you know, a lot of people, a, a lot of people really don't disclose at all. Um, but hopefully we can change that culture so that it is easier to come out and, you know, come out as autistic and, you know, be able to say I'm a doctor, I'm autistic and, and it not be a source of, you know, it's not newsworthy. It shouldn't be newsworthy. It is currently, but it shouldn't be. Um, so hopefully It should be informative, hmm. not newsworthy. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And then also actually, well, what does that mean for that particular autistic person? Because I think that's the difficulty at the moment is it's very they that there are the stereotypes. There is the the misunderstanding of what that could potentially mean. Yeah, for sure. And that's why I always advise somebody to say I am autistic and that means not just I am autistic because people don't have a clue what that means. So we need to be clear about what it means for us individually. Yeah. Yeah, because that potentially it could be, and I'm hypo reactive or I'm hyper reactive to certain sensory information, um, whereas otherwise they just assume that we're sensory sensitive to everything um, in, in a, um, a hyper reactive way. And it's not necessarily that at all. Um, OK, I think I'm just double checking. There's no key questions before we disappear. Somebody saying thank you for refocusing them because they were guilty of expecting their son to tolerate the waiting room. Um, now they'll uh, now when he says he can't go in, I'll go tell them and we'll be in the car. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, all the all the all the reception staff, all the medics, everybody's used to that now because that's what we're doing with all our patients to keep everybody safe. Um, so whereas before people weren't, you know, that would have seemed to, you know, huge change in practice. Um, now it's what we're doing. So we can continue to use that. Yeah, and I prefer it. Go in, distance in. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, lots of things are quite good for us. Yeah. Uh, out of this. Um, so the people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I enjoyed that. Yep, yeah, and feel free to just stay on the Zoom. I'm just going to close the live. So thank you everybody for coming over to learn. Um, as always, um, if you are able to just donate a pound, that would be great so that we can pay our speakers for their um, time and knowledge. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, and we will see you next Saturday when we will be doing uh, Ellis-Danlos syndrome. Mm. And actually, 
doing that because it was a pre-record because we thought that Jane was going to be having her operation, but it's been cancelled again. Um, so we did a pre-record for next week's session. Um, it's interesting and people who come in next week will see, I get to the end and I'm like, I have all of those experiences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the GP doesn't know because they're all disconnected and you talk about them in different times and different places. So yes, yeah, so that'd be an interesting one. But yes, thank you everybody. See you next week. I'm stopping the live.